you do when you don't know where you belong? Let's talk about it with journalist and author John Blake on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. You always have a seat at our table. In case you're wondering, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is our executive producer, and he's here. Matthew, I I noticed you ate some of the wedding cake Kathy brought in yesterday. You like wedding cake? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. Kathy got married. <laughs> <laughs> Our producer Jinx so is in the little yeah, glass booth, really and beloved. Jinx encourages everyone to try vegan, which will leave more meat for him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said try vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in the tech bunker. He fixes problems we can't see in ways we can't understand. <laughs> and Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George often feels like a blockbuster guy in a Netflix world. <laughs> and Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. When it comes to desserts, Kathy brings the cake. But when it comes to helping Key Life, she takes the cake. By the way, you had a oh, great that week. was a good that one, a Matthew. Good one. <laughs> okay. I like that you one. Using Chat GPT? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> you had a you had a wonderful time this past few days at your house, didn't you? Oh, Making we did. Cake. We did. What were you doing? Well, Reader's Digest condensed version. Our our president over there on the other side of the table, Mr. Bingham, has this lovely daughter who's getting married in September, and she and her fiance were home for the week, and so we had cake, wedding cake tasting on Friday <laughs> evening and uh, so they could decide what kind of cake they want me to make and it was way ones. fun five cakes five fillings and five frostings and as the mathematician or whatever he is Nathan said 125 possible choices and I said what <laughs> and five Where extra did you pounds get that from <laughs> yeah I was but gonna anyway. say I found the five pounds extra <laughs> Guys, we have a great guest John Blake is an award-winning CNN journalist. He's been honored by the Associated Press, the Society of Professional Journalists, the American Academy of Religion, the National Association of Black Journalists, and the Religion Communicators Council. He speaks regularly on race, religion, and politics. And John has a new book, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers. Uh, it's titled More Than I Imagined What a Black Man Discovered About the White Mother He Never Knew. John, I've been reading your book, and, uh, you know, there are places I wince, and I think, man, you have walked a hard road. Uh, and uh, I found it moving. Uh, I found it thought-provoking, and I felt myself touched as I read. Not only do you tell an incredible story, but at the same time, you tell it in a way that gets through all of the nonsense to the heart, and it, it'll affect you. You've got to get this book. Uh, you haven't read anything like it. More than I imagined what a black man discovered about the white mother he never knew. Um, it's a story, and that always presents a problem when you're doing an interview like this one. I mean, you can't tell the whole story on the air. And if he had more cognitive, more propositional, more truth expressed the way one would in a book of philosophy, I would know exactly what to ask. Did you... have you? Have you always known you were going to write, you were living this story? Did you always know that at some place you were going to write this story? 
No, and, and first of all, thanks for having me on your show and for those kind words. No, I I didn't think I would write this story because for so long, I was ashamed of this story. Mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in uh, inner city Baltimore, all black neighborhood. And my neighborhood is pretty famous or infamous. It's the setting for an HBO uh, series called The Wire. It was also the setting for a uh, very... Uh, uh, a race riot slash rebellion uprising in 2015 when a young black man named Freddie Gray was killed in police custody. So it's a place that's a symbol of racial anger. And and, and it's a place where I grew up where, frankly, nobody liked white people. So <laughs> growing up there, I grew up there where I call, I call myself a closeted biracial person. So to answer your question, I didn't want anybody to know that I had a white mother. I didn't want to think about it. And so... And also add to that, I knew that the reason I didn't know my mother's family or her is because they didn't like black people. So for so long, I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want any, anyone to know about it. So to think that I would be on a radio show or any or talking publicly <laughs> about it is very new to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't really expect that. What in the world changed your mind? You know, I, I understand the difficulties of being uh, black. And I understand what it means to be a honky. <laughs> I just don't want to be both, man. That means you, you're you in an awful position. Something must have gotten you to the point where you thought, I'm going to tell this story. And by the way, it's a wonderful story in so many ways. I'm going to tell this story. What changed your mind? I actually think it was when... I went back in 2015 to cover the race riot or slash rebellion in my neighborhood uh, uh, when Freddie Gray died in police custody. And I was assigned by CNN to cover this big event. And for people who don't know, this is one of the worst racial upheavals in our country's history. The National Guard, they were called out. Uh, there was martial law. I mean, the city went up in flames. And I remember going back to my neighborhood and seeing it come apart, seeing the places where I went to school, where I stood on the bus stop and hung out with my friends and see it going up in flames. And all this was happening because of racism. And yet at the same time, I knew that I was coming together with the white members of my family in a way I never expected despite racism. So it was just like kind of contradiction between what was happening on the outside, which was bad, but something really good was happening in my life. And I thought this, this could be worth sharing to, you know, with people. And mm -hmm. I think secondly, there's a kind of more distant reason why I wanted to share it. I've been writing, writing about race relations in this country for about 25 years. It is extremely exhausting to write about this stuff. Oh, I can imagine. When you see, yeah, the, the political and the racial divisions. And I thought to myself, I wanna read a story about hope that shows people coming together, but not a sappy sentimental one. And then I gradually realize, well, I might be living such a story. So let me mm. share that. Mm. Mm. I think it was a quote from somebody, but it may have been just you, that the solution is relationship. Uh, yeah. I believe that, by the way. I assume yeah, you do. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, um, and that's it, what one, you one of experienced the things I, when you, were, when you yeah. were covering that story. You, you covered a lack of a relationship, but experienced yourself relationship. And that made a difference. Yeah, it made a huge difference. Um, so what I say in the book is that I discovered something that kind of clashed with my identity as a reporter and a journalist. So journalists, we're supposed to venerate facts. If we just present the facts to people, that will change them. And for a long time, I thought, you know, if... If you're trying to convince people, for example, that racism is a serious problem in this country, if we just show people all these videos of unarmed black and brown people being brutalized or killed, that would change their mind. You know, we, if, we, if we expose them to this study or this or that. But I found that didn't really change people. And I asked myself, what really changed people? And I looked at my life and I looked at what changed me and the white relatives who didn't want anything to do with me. And I realized it was really the relationships that we developed. So what I say is facts don't change people, relationships do. 
And I think that's a lesson that a lot of people who fight for racial justice have forgotten, frankly. And I think maybe, uh, and it's true of most of us, we have a higher view of human nature uh, than the facts would warrant. You know, we assume we show people good things, they'll act in good ways, and that's not true. Uh, we assume that people are basically good and that they are benevolent and kind. And as a matter of fact, people are not basically good and benevolent and kind. We're screwed up. Well, at least I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I get fixed only by a relationship. And that relationship starts with the God of the universe. And then it proceeds to other people. And then I become the spiritual giant who is talking to you <laughs> <laughs> right now. Guys, you don't want to miss a bit of this. This is a great book. More than I imagined what a black man discovered about a white mother that he never knew. We'll hear some of that story and some of the principles and the truths that come from it. So... You don't want to go anyplace. This, by the way, is very hard work. And uh, we must periodically take a rest, have some milk and cookies. And once rested up, like Jesus, we'll come back. So don't go anywhere. that you would do that as a high and holy privilege and a compliment, and we see it as that. We're uh, talking to a journalist and author, John Blake, and his new book is called More Than I Imagined, What a Black Man Discovered About the White Mother He Never Knew. John, uh, first of all, powerful book. I we we talk to authors literally every single week and I would be hard pressed to recall a book in recent memory where it has engaged me kind of that on emotional and very moving level. Uh it's just such a powerful portrait of of just a young man and you see these terrible things happen and um I have little kids, I have little sons and you can't not put put myself in those those scenes. And as I'm reading it the uh, the the idea comes to me of this I the idea that understanding is not the same thing as agreeing. They're separate, related things, but separate. So you're surrounded in a community that has a lot of racism, and you're like, yeah, racism of any variety is wrong, but you can see a path to where these people arrived at that. And even without agreeing, I can go, okay, I can, I can see your math there. So I wondered if you would take us into that environment and kind of a little, what's the next chapter of your um, racial understanding of, of growing up this environment and, and feeling like you maybe don't have a home culturally? Okay. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Um, so when I was born to an a interracial couple, in the mid 60s, interracial marriage was illegal in much of the country. There was no Obama. There were no uh, biracial role models. You didn't look on a Cheerios box and see an interracial kid. Uh, they interracial couples really didn't exist in the public eye, and their children were seen as objects of pity. People felt sorry for them because they said they don't. They're not accepted in either world. So when I grew up. What I say in a book is I felt like half of my identity had been amputated because I knew nothing about my mother or her side, which was the white side of my family. Um, she disappeared from my life not long after I was born. And all I was told was uh, your mother's white, her name is Shirley, and her family hates black people. So that's all I knew. But in the world I grew up, most people hated white people. And what, I, what I'm trying to convey there is that, get to your question, 
is that I think sometimes when people think about racism, they think that um, it is taught, like people tell you, hate black people, hate white people, hate this people. But a lot of times it's, it's absorbed in the environment. No yeah, one right. told me to hate white people. Right. It's what I heard, it's what I saw. And here's the, 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 uh, the clincher. I learned these lessons from people I love, people I respected, people my family, school teachers, they said these things. So that's, that's the environment I grew up in. And one of the things that really helped me connect with the white members of my family is that they had a problem with racism too. For example, when my father tried to visit my mom, her father called him the N-word, physically assaulted him, and had him arrested. But one of the things that helped me connect with him and other members of my family is that they grew up in an incredibly racially segregated world where they absorbed the same lessons about race that I did. They didn't see any black people. So they grew up hating black people, didn't even know they did. So I, there's a line that I use at the end of the book. I said that when I saw them, that what was in them was also in me. And that created a little humility in me. And I said, you know what? I can reach out to them because I can understand how easy it is to hate. Oh, man. Mm. That's kind of a key, isn't it? In any communication, especially, and this is a religious program, basically, and a religious ministry, um, that's, the, that's the key for Christians. As long as we're good and you're bad, and we'll make you good if you'll join with us, nobody's going to listen because it's a lie, because it's not true. But when we say what you just said, I saw in me what I saw in them. Maybe now we can talk. That's the key to witnessing. It's the key to communication. It's the key to relationship. Um, John, um, I, you know, the uh, major thrust is that story with your uh, white mother, black father. Uh, but there were some elements of your story that were really important, it seems to me, of just the kind of family situation you had growing up or, or lack of. Can you just give a little overview of that uh, with you and your brother? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up primarily in foster homes. So I didn't know, of course, my mother or her family. They were gone. But my father was a merchant seaman. So he spent about eight months overseas. So there was no one to take care of us for the most part. So we spent most of our times in these foster homes and they were pretty cruel places. Um, and uh, it was just a time of uh, somebody, somebody who read the book said it read like a Charles Dickens novel. You yeah. know, you see these little <laughs> yeah. kids in the Charles. I, ne I never thought of it that, that way at the time. That's all I knew. But what I will say about these places is that as difficult as it was, there was always somebody it seemed like that God was sending to my life to let to, to, to give me a little kindness, to give me a little hope. Mm. And in particular, I had an aunt who watched me over the weekend, and she became like the surrogate mom. She was the one who got me involved in books and reading and convinced me that I had a future. And my our brother used to say, sometimes when you're going through a difficult time as a kid, all you need is that one person who believes in you. That's all a kid needs sometimes. And that, I had that in my aunt. Mm. Your brother was also a gift to you, too, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, you, yeah great. You both yeah. are still close? Extremely close. Yeah, we're not even a year apart. We talk all the time. And, uh, yeah, he, um, I had to look out for him. Uh, when I was a, mm. And I think that helped me as a kid. We were in all these difficult situations. And uh, I, I had to look out for him as an older brother. Yeah, my mother always said, look out for your kid brother. That's your responsibility. And then, the, then he died on me, and <laughs> it ruined everything. Because <laughs> I couldn't fix that. But I just can't tell you. And I identified with your relationship with your brother, uh, with my brother, uh, who was yeah. my best friend. Well, we're coming up on a break, so um, I wanted you to begin to touch a little bit, John, on the issue of the interracial 
interracial churches or multi multiracial what the proper terminology churches and I had a a quote that I found in chapter seven of the book that I wanted to kind of follow up with on that but we are coming up on a break so maybe we just have better wait until we get on the other side of it that would probably be okay. good yeah and then you can figure out what you're going to say now for 42 seconds <laughs> if, on, if only we had brought cake yeah <laughs> oh we could get cake right. <laughs> great book you gotta get it uh this would be uh this would be a good book for a small group discussion uh, yeah uh, more than i imagined what a black man discovered about a white mother he never knew we have discussed how relationships make the difference in a lot of ways well maybe if you don't have the relationships you can read about them and then go out and do likewise. Don't go anywhere. award-winning journalist and author John Blake. You can keep up with him at johnkblake.com and on Twitter at johnblakecnn. Uh, John, it's been said for a long time that the most segregated, uh, I think it's the most segregated hour of the week is 11 o'clock on Sundays. Of course, that changes a little bit nowadays because since so many churches have so many different times when you can actually go and worship. But, um, you know, black people are in black churches, white people are in white churches, and then you hear about, uh, you know, people that are trying to change that. Um, I was a part of a church at one time that, uh, was trying to make, and I think very well-meaning, uh, took very well-meaning steps to try to uh, inform each other's congregations about, you know, uh, what was going, what was transpiring um, in black congregations by bringing that into the white church and vice versa, et cetera. And um, for some reason, it seems like interracial churches for the most part, don't ever really accomplish what it is they set out to do. Is is that an accurate statement? And and how do we how do we get to know our our the part of our family that is on the other side of the street worshiping in another church? Yeah, I, I think it is accurate. The research shows one that it's very difficult to create these interracial slash multicultural churches. And two, that even if you create them, they don't tend to last. Because what will happen sooner or later is if the population in a church, in a multiracial church, if it tips past a certain ratio of like, say, black and brown people, white members leave. And that happens in neighborhoods, it happens in schools, but that also happens in churches. And I saw that happen right in front of my eyes. I went to a very famous interracial church in Atlanta that was known for being interracial. But when the neighborhood around the church turned to primarily black, all the white people left and it became all black within a matter of years. So that is the tough side of, of creating a, a multicultural interracial church. But I've also seen the good side. The One of the things I tried to show in my, my book is that there's a lot of talk about uh, white evangelical Christians, a lot of criticism about racism in the white evangelical Christian churches. But the thing is, that the people that really reached out to me, that connected with me, were white evangelical Christians who belonged to an interracial church, and I met them in college. And when I went to this interracial white evangelical church, the guy who was trying to convert me, he talked all about the cross and atonement and all these things, saying this is why you should be converted. That meant nothing to me. But when I saw white and black and brown people hug one another, 
call each other brother and sister, become friends. That was the thing that clenched it for me. And mm. so I think we can do it. We have to, we, we have to do it. And I've been in other churches that do it well. And I want to add this, but the thing is, to do it well, I think you have to understand, you don't have to understand, but it's helpful to understand this. There's a difference between a racially mixed church and a racially integrated church. Mm. In a racially mixed church, people of different races share the pews, you know, white, black, and brown. In a racially integrated church, people of different races share the pews and they share power as well. If I, as a black person, go to, a, uh, say, a, a racially mixed church, I look to my left and right and I see black and brown people, that's cool. But if I look on the pulpit and I only see white men, that's a problem. If only the only decisions that are made about the church, the worship style, only reflect one culture, that's a problem. Mm. The churches that make it work, the multicultural churches that make it work, they find ways to acknowledge the culture, uh, to bring into leadership people of other races. That sounds simple, but a lot of churches don't really do that. What That's, that's wise, that's wise true. comments. I have a couple of granddaughters, and, I'm, and you're not going to believe this. Nobody will. Uh, they went to um, university in Jackson, Mississippi, and both mm -hmm. of them attended a church in a white neighborhood pastored by a wonderful black pastor. He had Hispanic uh, associates, and I thought I didn't express it the way you did, but now I understand not only did they sit in the pews together, they shared the power, and that was the amazing miracle, and that it happened in Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. uh, even yeah. goes uh, further to make a miracle mm -hmm. uh, out of it. We're going to have well, you. Steve, yeah. I'd like to add something. I mean, isn't that the pitch of the church in the book of Acts? Yes. I mean, that's the thing. Jews, Gentiles, women, people who were enslaved, all sharing power, being in the same place. This is in our DNA. This is what we're supposed to be in the first place. And in the book of Acts, the first fight the church had was over that issue. Yeah. And the way they worked it out was to share the power. Uh, an important thing to remember. Now, it helps when a neighborhood changes if the pastor preaches a sermon like you guys are going to get the fever and die and <laughs> probably go to hell if you leave this church anytime soon. And if he's a good enough preacher, he maybe can pull that off. <laughs> Now, I wouldn't do anything like that, yeah. ever. Hey, the name of the book is More Than Imagined. What a black man discovered about the white mother he never knew. We're going to hear the stories on the other side of the break. And like Jesus, we're coming back. for joining us. Uh, by the way, do you subscribe to our weekly Key Life email? You don't. Your friends will look down on you if you don't. You poor dear. Well, <laughs> I didn't write this. Matthew wrote it, and I'm just reading it. Did okay? he say the poor dear part, too? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think well, so. what I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted <laughs> While you're thinking about it, go to keylife.org slash subscribe and give it a try. And you'll mm. rise up and call us blessed for having given that. We want uh, we need uh, to hear some stories, John. But the first story you got to tell, <laughs> and I know you're uncomfortable telling it, but you put it in a dumb book, so you... <laughs> You know, everybody knows it now, so if they read the book. But tell us about the appearance of your grandfather. So uh, I was told, people told me that if you put this 
been there, uh, people are going to think you need therapy or something. <laughs> but I've had to, uh, we want to hear know, it. What does that say about us? It, yeah. <laughs> right, right. I had to put it in there because it was crucial to my development and reconnecting with my white family members. And, it, and it's true. And it happened. If it only happened when I was present, I wouldn't have not, I would not have shared it with anyone. I would have thought, well, I'll just imagine this. But these situations, these uh, incidents took place when someone else was present in each case. So the backstory is, if there, there was a boogeyman in my childhood, it was my mother's father. I didn't know him. I just heard stories about him, about how incredibly racist he was, how he called my father the N-word, how he had him arrested. How he, and, and he died uh, long before I became an adult. So I never knew him. But when I was a young kid, um, it's something strange happened one night when I awakened in the middle of the night and I saw a white man walking through my bedroom, uh, poking through my, my, my dresser drawers, like looking for things. And my brother was below me in a bunk bed. And uh, I watched this man and he wasn't quite all there. Um, half of his body was kind of like gone. He was like a disembodied. He just kind of floated above the of above the bedroom floor and i thought i was imagining things but when i awakened the next morning i could see red footprints all over my bedroom door i mean floor and all through the hallway all through the house and he had taken some things from me and i talked to my brother patrick and he had seen the same white man i had no idea i was only about like eight not eight years old i had no idea who he was I didn't talk about it with my brother for years afterward. I mean, what can you do with something like that? Mm -hmm. Then I became an adult. I was dating my then wife and uh, my, well, my now wife. And um, I, we awakened one morning and she looked at me with these, she was like terrified. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she said, well, I tried to awaken you last night. And I said, well, what happened? She said, there was this man standing over the bed looking at you peering down at you with this troubled expression on his face. And uh, I just felt this chill. And I got a picture of my grandfather. And I oh, said, was man. this the man? And she said, yes. Now, there's a point to this story. I don't think you just tell a story just because it's a ghost story. Why, why did he keep coming back? And this is what I think happened. There's a belief, those who fight against racism, that racism hurts white people as well as black and brown people. And they make arguments that it hurts white people when they vote for they say politicians who don't really have their economic interest. Okay, that's we know that. But I think racism also hurts white people because it does something to their soul. My grandfather, I believe, felt tremendous guilt because he rejected me because I was half black. He had nothing to do with me. And I felt that guilt consumed him so much that even when he died, he couldn't stay. He couldn't. He had to somehow reach out to me to show me that he felt sorry for what he did. And now what I had to do to try to come to terms with these visits, I had to kind of, in a sense, forgive him. And you can't forgive somebody you don't know, so I had to come to learn about him. And one of the things I learned from learning about him is that you can't define somebody by their worst act. I used to think that you're either a racist or you're not, and there's no in between. But people are complex. This same man who treated my father that way I found out that his best friend was a black man. And the last mm. person he called before he died was a black man. So he had good and bad in him. And when I saw that, when I saw and I began to understand that he had grown up in, he had grown up in this all white world, he was a victim just as much as I was of racism. And that in a sense, I haunted him. He didn't just haunt me. I was able to forgive him and the visit stopped. Oh man. Hmm. Tell us about when you first met your mother. You know, we don't Ooh. have a lot. Are we in the final segment? Oh, yeah. Spit. It flies I don't know by. Where this hour went. I know. We need about five hours with mm -hmm. you. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we don't have a lot of time. But tell us how, tell us about that experience. I, I didn't meet my mom until I was 17 on my way to college. I grew up thinking that she's probably dead. I didn't know what she looked like, the sound of her voice, or anything. And then one day my, my father just comes to me and says, hey, do you want to meet your mom? It was a bombshell. Mm. And I found myself, along with my brother, being driven to this brick red building that looked like a, a set for the Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> and I walk into this room and she comes out and I see this thin white woman and she's just a glow, just so happy to see me. 
and you know, she's calling my name and she wants me to hug her and I feel awkward. But what was so awkward about that, besides that being the first time I met my mom, is that it was in the middle of a mental institution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mother had been taken away from me in part because she had been institutionalized because she had a severe form of mental illness called schizophrenia. So nobody told me in my family. They didn't even tell me on the day when I met her that that was her condition. Now, one of the things that was really important about that meeting, besides the meeting itself, is that at 17 years old, I had never thought that a white person could understand what it meant to be black, to be treated with contempt, to be discriminated against because of how you were born. But when I saw my mom in that hellish mental institution, she shattered that assumption within the first 15 minutes of the first time I met her. For the first time in my life, I began to feel empathy toward white people, like, wait a minute, they're not so different. They suffer like us. And that was what one of the things that was really important about that meeting. Oh, man. Gosh. John, this has been a, an absolutely wonderful hour. And by the way, when you get the book, you got to read about her, his mother's funeral and his brother and he's being there. It was, John, you did a good thing in writing this book. Mm -hmm. you, uh, Thank you. I Thank hope you, a lot of people read it. And I think this book, if it's read and understood, could make a real difference and some of the racial divisions that are going on right now. And also, John, whenever you're on our program, you get three free sins. <laughs> and uh, you, uh, you must use them very wisely because <laughs> you, after all, are a Christian. And you can't just go out and sin anytime you want. But for three of them, they're free. John, you're a blessing. Thanks for being with us, and we appreciate it Thank very you. much. Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Guys, we're going to come back for a short time and tell you who's going to be here next week. And as always, you will be amazed. And uh, it will, it will, you just won't believe it. So don't go anywhere. While we rest up, just sit there and make sure that you come back. your time we never do you know we have a serious problem in this country and and uh, i don't want to make this into a sermon or anything but we have uh, we have some divisions that are not just racial they're political and social and they're deep and they're angry and if you listen to the haters uh those who um, who have all the answers, the talking heads that are mad and, and hate those who disagree, we're never going to get anywhere. What you got to do is find somebody like our guest who is kind and gentle and wise and has learned a way to get to other people. Um, so if you, if you don't know any Hispanic people, get to know them. Uh, invite them out for pizza uh, or do it the way Kathy does. You know, have Invite their children to your house and teach them how to bake cookies or whatever. If you know somebody who's black and you're white and uh, the best thing you can do is not be angry and wave a political flag. The best thing you can do is make some friends who are uh, African-American friends and racism isn't just a white thing, it's a black thing too. And I like that John being willing to say racism on both sides are bad. So if you're black and you don't have any white friends, I get that. But stop it. Find some friends who uh, look pale, who <laughs> 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 look like me, but maybe with hair. And <laughs> go to lunch and get to know them and their family. And what you'll discover is that underneath the skin is something that you share, and that is you're all sinners. We all are sinners. 
and we have a great Savior, and that's the solution to racial division, I think. But I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm right. <laughs> Kathy, who's going to be here next week? Next week, our friend Adam Mabry is going to be with us. His uh, new book is titled, When God Seems Gone, Finding Hope When Nothing Makes Sense. And at an effort at honesty, Adam's a member of my family, sort of, <laughs> by marriage. Distantly. Sort of. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm quite proud of him. He's got some really good and profound things to say. And I'm going to have fun introducing him to you next week. It's our fond hope that you'll be here. Uh, same time, same place. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth. <laughs> oh, we didn't tell those who were doing that. We're doing that now. <laughs> well, Whether we I, want to or not. Yeah, yeah no, I'd be amazing. I don't think I should put all of our pictures up in the I'm going to one, two, three.